Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's really nice to be here. I want to thank uh, DJ and Kariana uh, Wilson and uh, State of Reform for sponsoring this great uh, conference here. Uh, as DJ said, uh, it's been a while since I've done this, um, so I expect I'm going to be a little bit rusty. Uh, but I promise you, in vintage Kitzhaber fashion, that I will lead you into the policy weeds sometime during this 30-minute period. So as you know, we're approaching the end of the first five-year waiver for our new CCO care model. And I think we're at a very pivotal point in terms of where we want that model to go, both because of the fiscal challenges that we're looking at in the upcoming legislative session, but also because of the growing recognition that if this model doesn't continue to evolve, we're going to fall short in our effort to meet the triple aim. So today, in discussing the path forward, I'd like to put the challenges facing our CCOs into the larger context of Oregon's 30-year story of healthcare transformation. And I want to pose a question. What is the next chapter in that story going to look like? Now, to do that, <clears throat> to answer that question, we have to start with some basics. So to me, if we're going to be successful going forward, we have to actually agree on what we want our health policy to accomplish. Seems pretty sensible, right? So the most fundamental question is whether our objective is to finance and deliver medical care or whether it's to keep people healthy. And if we can agree that our objective is health, there's two more things that we have to come to terms with. The first one is that health care is not necessarily synonymous with health, although our entire system is predicated on that implied assumption. But the fact is that health care is a means to an end not an end in itself, and it doesn't have any intrinsic value outside its relationship to a positive health outcome except as an economic commodity, which unfortunately is pretty much how we view it today. That's point one. Point two is that if you look at those things that actually have the greatest impact on your lifetime health status, let's see if I can get my slide up here. So you probably saw this with Alan Yorty's uh, presentation this morning, but the fact is healthcare contributes about 10% to our lifetime health status. It's socioeconomic issues, it's environmental issues, it's lifestyle and behavioral issues, it's environmental issues that by far contribute the greatest to our lifetime health status. And that brings us back to the current decision point about where to go with our coordinated care models. If our policy goal is health, but we continue to focus on medical care at the expense of the social investments that actually make a much bigger difference in community health, we're simply not going to meet that objective. So <clears throat> it's really been our historic pattern of pr prioritizing medical care over the social determinants of health that have led us to this curious point in 2016 where we are spending almost 8% of our GDP, over $3 trillion a year, on this industry that manages to make a profit producing goods and services that few of its customers can actually afford and producing embarrassingly poor population health statistics. So to understand how that situation came about and to understand why it's so hard to change something that seems illogical and contrary to our policy objective, uh, let me tell you a story. And now you get to see this guy. So in 2003, I took a friend of mine from New York City down the Rogue River on a rafting trip. And it was August, and the salmon were spawning. And one day, we drift by this huge male Chinook, maybe 30, 35 pounds, just a magnificent creature. And he's still pointing upstream, but he's struggling against the current and against his fading, his fading strength. And he was all beat up. You guys have probably seen those big fall spawners. I see Phil Greenhill from the South Coast. He's probably seen a few of them. You know, he had scars on his sides. His fins were all tattered, patches of fungus all over his body and his big jaws opening and closing, just trying to get a little more oxygen. And um, <clears throat> he was way downstream from the spawning beds where he'd been born maybe five years earlier. He wasn't going to make it. He was going to die in the attempt. But in death, he was going to give himself to the river and provide those nutrients that are essential to the survival of the next generation. Now, I've always felt that the life cycle of the salmon is this lovely metaphor not only for the relationship between life and death, but also for the responsibility that each generation owes to the next. But my friend from New York City just stared at this salmon, and then finally she turns to me and she says, my God, what's wrong with that fish? And without even thinking, I said, well, you know, there's nothing wrong with him. He's just dying. 
So you don't hear that too often in our medical system, do you? When's the last time you heard a doctor say, well, you know, there's nothing wrong with you, you're just dying, all right? The reason is because in our society, we don't view death as a natural part of the life process. We view it, view it as something abnormal, something foreign. During my entire training, it was pounded into me to view death as a failure, as an adverse outcome. And as a consequence, through our medical system, we've developed this un limited array of diagnostic and therapeutic interventions with which we treat disease and disability and try to stave off the inevitable consequences of aging. And that in turn has produced this huge and increasingly profitable industry that's dedicated not just to developing new technologies, but to financing and delivering them for the benefit of individuals. And if you view medical technology from an individual standpoint, it is miraculous, no question about it. If you view them from a societal standpoint, there's a darker side because this understandable focus on individuals wouldn't create a problem if everyone could afford the cost of his or her own health care. But that's not the case in 2016. Today, we increasingly rely on public resources to finance the cost of care for individuals. So we've created this system that focuses unlimited care and benefit one person at a time while relying on shared public resources to finance the cost of that care. So I would argue that what is really in contention in the health care debate is the allocation of public resources and who benefits from that allocation. People who can afford the cost of their own care aren't the problem. Furthermore, what people do with their own after-tax dollars is their own business. But what we do with public dollars is everybody's business. Because I believe that public resources represent a fiscal commons. Resources that have been raised from all of us and should be used to benefit all of us, not just some of us. Furthermore, public resources are limited, they're finite. If they weren't limited, legislators wouldn't have to make any difficult budget choices. If they were not limited, we wouldn't be trying to raise $6 billion with Measure 97 this fall. And we wouldn't have a national debt that's approaching $20 trillion. So public resources are finite. And in a zero-sum budget, that's a budget where resources are limited, a decision to spend those dollars on one set of services at the same time precludes the opportunity to spend them on another set of services. That means that if our policy objective is health, then there are two sets of choices that legislators have to make to maximize the health benefit across the population. And this is important because I'm going to come back to it. One set of decisions involves how to spend money within the healthcare budget. So whether you're going to buy MRIs or specialty drugs or prenatal care or, you know, dental sealants for kids. The second set of choices is how to spend money between the health care budget and other budgets. Whether you're going to increase medical spending or, say, invest in low-income housing or child development. Now, those aren't easy questions to ask or answer because sometimes they have life or death consequences. So that's one of the reasons we rarely even ask them. But the reason we're here today, the reason that Oregon is so far ahead of most other states in transforming its healthcare system, is because 30 years ago, Oregon sought to ask and answer exactly those questions. And that effort led to the development of the Oregon Health Plan. And let me tell you what happened. Some of you may remember. In 1987, the Oregon legislature discontinued funding for organ transplants on the Medicaid program, largely for budgetary reasons. And all this, although this was an explicit public rationing decision, it was really uncontroversial. It was totally uncovered by the media, undoubtedly because there was no one who needed a transplant there when the legislature made the decision. So three months later, in September, the legislature's gone home, and seven-year-old Kobe Howard had an exacerbation of his acute lymphoblastic anemia. So his physician applied to the state for a bone marrow transplant, and of course the state no longer covered the service, although Kobe was eligible for Medicaid. So the family then turned to private fundraising. And that immediately caught the attention of both the state and, 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 the, and the national media. And throughout November, we watched this terrible tragedy unfold every day uh, on the nightly news and in the newspapers um, as the chemotherapy transformed this just beautiful child into kind of a balding, frail waif. And Kobe died uh, in early December in Emanuel Hospital. Uh, still hadn't found a marrow match, still didn't have the money needed to provide that transplant. So the next month, a motion was made before the Legislative Emergency Board to partially fund the program for eight people who had applications pending. 
And as Senate President, I opposed that motion, as did then House Speaker Vera Katz. And the ensuing debate, which was largely, largely viewed as a debate over transplants, was actually a debate over something much more fundamental. How do we allocate limited resources in a way that's fair and that maximizes that benefit uh, across the population? So the question wasn't whether we had the money to buy another transplant or whether they, they had merit. Clearly they did, and we had the money. It was like, I don't know, $200,000. The question was simply this, if the state was going to spend more money in its health care budget, where should that next dollar go? What was the policy that would lead us to buy eight transplants as opposed to eight or, eight or 18 or 80? What was the policy that would lead us to pay for transplants as opposed to expanding access to prenatal care? Is one more important than the other? What was the policy that would lead us to spend more money on health care before spending money on other things like low-income housing? And where was the equity in taking one group of low-income Oregonians who were eligible for Medicaid and giving them additional services before we expanded Medicaid eligibility to hundreds of thousands of equally needy Oregonians, many of them children, who were excluded from the system altogether? And what became apparent is that there was no policy. We were re reacting to this highly emotional uh, situation, and we had no way of knowing how best to allocate these re resources in a way that would maximize the benefit. We did know that buying another eight transplants would certainly help eight people. We had no way of knowing or being accountable for the consequences of not spending that money to expand access to other Oregonians who currently were excluded from the, the system altogether. Now, when we defeated the motion, that really got the national media attention. I got named Dr. Death in Newsweek magazine, uh, and I had the dubious distinction of being uh, invited to appear on 60 Minutes in Nightline with Ted Koppel and the Today Show to defend the decision that the uh, legislature had made, which proved to be a very difficult task. Uh, on the Today Show with Brian Gumbel, I appeared with another Oregonian whose name was Craig Irwin, whose mother Kay also needed a transplant. And like Kobe, she was also eligible for Medicaid, but the, uh, program, didn't, or the program didn't cover those, those procedures. So the show started out with this dramatic video of Kobe Howard and the, and the, and the great tragedy of his death, which indeed it was. Um, uh, I'm actually going to post the link uh, to that uh, Today Show on my website uh, sometime later this week. You will see that it was the longest six minutes of my entire life. Um, Gumbel gave Craig the first opportunity to essentially argue on behalf of his mother. And, you know, he made this beautiful, heartfelt, emotional, powerful appeal. And I would have done exactly the same thing if I'd been in his place. But I wasn't. And when they gave me my turn, of course, I tried to make this larger policy decision. And it's really hard to come across as compassionate when you're arguing on behalf of thousands of anonymous, invisible people when Craig's arguing on, on behalf of his mother. But that's just the problem. The people I was advocating for the people who are completely excluded from the healthcare system are anonymous. And from the standpoint of our public policy, they're invisible. And that really bothered me in 1988, and it really bothers me today. And I hope it bothers you as well. So Oregon sought to address that inequity by being the first state in the nation that honestly confronted the reality of fiscal limits and challenged this fragmented federal policy that allocated the fiscal commons in a way that gave some people everything and other people nothing. And so what we tried to do was ensure that all those who couldn't afford the cost of their health care at least got access to those health services that provided the most health benefit. And we did that by rejecting the complex system of categorical eligibility and create, created a coverage floor by expanding Medicaid to everybody with an income below the federal poverty level and preventing the legislature from changing income eligibility so they could drop anonymous vulnerable, invisible people from coverage in order to reduce the cost of the Medicaid program. So really what the health plan did is it shifted the allocation debate from who is covered to what is covered. And as you know, the way we determined what is covered is we created this health services commission that prioritized health services from the most important to the least important based on the relative health benefit to the entire population. Uh, and if, in the case of a revenue shortfall, everyone stayed covered. And we would then reduce the benefits, starting with those services that had the least health benefit. And if I might just add here, our friend and colleague, the late Dr. Alan Bates, was on that very first commission. And his work 
and the work of people like Rick Wolpat and others uh, helped lead us to where we are today. So let's just hear it for Alan Bates. Huh? Now, as you might imagine, this is a somewhat controversial proposal, and it took us three years to get the waivers we needed, but the program was finally implemented in February of, uh, of 2000, uh, excuse me, of 1994. Since then, millions of Oregonians have benefited from that program, both because of the expanded coverage and the increase in provider reimbursement rates, but also because of the way the prioritized benefit was put together. But here's the thing, the Oregon Health Plan took for granted the delivery system and the incentives in it. It never really took on the issue of cost or cost inflation, and it never connected the dollars we spent on healthcare with outcomes or quality. So all that changed in 2011 with the coordinated care organizations. Now, the Oregon Health Plan came out of a substantive and difficult policy debate uh, that led to expanded coverage and better reimbursement. The CCOs came out of the scarcity of the Great Recession. Now, you know, one of the reasons it's so hard to transform the, transform the healthcare system is because we keep paying for it. As long as you keep paying for the current system, people have no incentive to change it. Well, in 2011, the incentive arrived in the form of a $1.2 billion hole in the Medicaid budget. Now, that shortfall was due to increased caseload because of high unemployment and a, and a seriously depleted state general fund. And if we were to continue to cover everyone who was eligible for Medicaid with no replacement revenue, that would amount to a 39% cut in pro provider reimbursement. And that actually got people's attention. So through a combination of benefit changes and administrative efficiencies and front-end loading the resources we had into the first year of Oregon's two-year budget cycle, we brought that 39% cut down to 11 but that still left a $250 million hole in the second year of the biennium. $600 million hole if you count the federal match. And our plan was to fill that hole from savings that we would find from transforming the Medicaid care model to get more value for each dollar we spent. Although when I submitted my 2011-13 budget, I had no idea uh, how we were gonna actually do this. Have you ever heard the term betting on the come? Well, I've got the Webster's Dictionary definition here. Betting on the come means you don't have what you need now at the moment, but you are betting or hoping that you will have what you need when the time comes. That's pretty much what we were doing in 2011. Now, as it turns out, it's actually not that hard to figure out how to reduce the cost of medical care and improve quality and outcomes. But nobody has any incentive to do it as long as you keep paying for the current system, right? There's no motivation. Well, under the circumstances, the Medicaid fiscal crisis is what created the motivation. Providers were motivated to engage because they didn't want a 39% rate cut. And the legislature that had its own sort of huge budget deficit was delighted when we told them, you know something, we can find $250 million in savings the second year of the biennium, although we are not quite sure how we're gonna do it. So in March 2012, legislation was passed that set up the, the criteria for creating these coordinated care organizations, and the first ones came up, I think, in August of that year. By then, it was very clear that even though we thought that the coordinated care organizations could find that savings through changing the care model, it was clear that that system change wasn't going to be fast enough to get that money into the current budget cycle. So on May 1st, Bruce Goldberg, uh, a, great, a great American, and Tina Edeland, another one, and I went back to Washington, D.C. and managed to convince the Obama administration not just to give us the waivers to implement the CCO model, but also to give us a $1.9 billion five-year investment in the CCOs in exchange for a commitment to reduce the Medicaid trend rate from 5.4 to 3.4 percent by the second year of the waiver, with no reduction in benefit, no reduction in eligibility, and while meeting rigorous uh, cost, uh, excuse me, outcome and, and quality metrics. <clears throat> the waiver also gave us flexibility, the CCO's flexibility in their budgets to spend money on things that aren't considered traditional medical services but still have an impact on health. And of course, my favorite is buying the window air conditioner for the, uh, you know, the woman uh, who has congestive heart failure so that her uh, condition doesn't worsen in the summer and requires a hospitalization. So now we're approaching the end of that first five-year waiver period. And I think it's very important as we seek another waiver and another investment to remember and understand why that investment was necessary 
as well as the conditions and expectations uh, that came with it. So any major system transformation, whether it's healthcare, education, economic development, or energy, uh, requires a transition period, right, during which the old system has to operate even while the new system is being put into place. And Dar Don Berwick calls that the challenge of moving from the current state to the future state. And on this chart, on the horizontal axis is time, and on the vert vertical axis is the economic burden on all the stakeholders who are engaged, right? And if you could move from the current state to the future state and the economic burden on everybody went down, it would actually be easy, right? Uh, everyone would win. The problem is that it looks more like this next slide. Uh, because you're operating two systems uh, simultaneously, there is always uh, an increase in the economic burden in the short term, shown on, as a hump on this slide. And if you can't figure out a way to fund that hump, if you can't figure out a way to fund that transition, then the individual stakeholders are going to dig in and oppose anything that will adversely impact their short-term short economic, uh, economic interests. So when we created the CCO model, we knew that we had to fund the hump. We knew that we had to make an investment to allow this gradual transition from the old system to the new system. But we were in the middle of the Great Recession, uh, and we didn't have a lot of spare change hanging around. So our plan was to fund the hump through transforming the system. And when it became apparent that we couldn't do it fast enough, we managed to get the federal government uh, to do it for us by giving us a $1.9 billion investment on a gradually declining five-year payment schedule. But let's be clear. We did not get that investment to simply prop up the old care model during the revenue shortfall of the Great Recession. We got it so that we could create a five-year glide path so that uh, the federal investment gradually went down as the cost savings from the CCOs began to accrue. And that is exactly what we did. And I just have to thank the tremendous leadership of the people who are running those organizations. They all are operating within the, the growth cap, and they're, they're meeting all, if not, uh, if not most, of the quality and outcome metrics required by the waiver, right? But that waiver, that investment, and that glide pass end next year when the waiver expires. So where do we go from here? Where do we go from here? Actually, I have an answer. The answer is another transformational step but one that is gonna be a lot more difficult than the one we made in 1989 when we created the health plan and more difficult than the one we made in 2011 when we created the coordinated care organizations because the next transition is going to require a cultural change in our healthcare system and a change in the way we have traditionally allocated public resources for healthcare. You know, during my training, I was not only taught that death was an adverse outcome, I was also taught that the most direct path to health ran inevitably through the medical system. So for years, when I thought about health, I thought about doctors and hospitals and antibiotics and insulin and heart valves. I didn't think about schools or nutrition or housing or whether you had a good job or whether you have a stable, attached family. But as we have seen, those are the things that make the greatest impact on community health. So to illustrate that, let's compare the US to the OECD nations on a few key metrics, all right? So the OECD, as you know, the, the Organization for Economic Development and Cooperation is comprised of 34 market democracies that includes most of Europe, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, Korea, uh, Canada, Mexico. And if you look at this slide, you can see that the US is really an outlier a staggering outlier in terms of the amount of money we spend on healthcare. Almost 18% of our GDP compared to about 10% for the OECD nation. If you look at this, this shows total health investment, right? Which includes both medical care, which is in blue, and social investment, which is in red. And you can see that the US here spends far more on medical care than anybody else and a lot less on the social investments, which is just the opposite of the OECD nations, which spend far more on social uh, investments and less on medical care. Okay, the next slide. So then when you look at the ratio of social spending or healthcare spending to social spending, you can see that we're, again, an outlier, just way on the end. So we're on, on the one end, we're off the charts in terms of the total amount we spend on the other end of the chart, we're, we're off the chart in terms of that, that, that important ratio. But the fact is that the OECD nations have far better population health statistics than the United States does. So let's remember, our policy objective here is health, not just financing medical care. So that is testimony to the fact that investments in the social determinants of the health 
are going to move us much farther towards a healthy population and a healthy community than simply spending money on medical care. So once again, we're faced with exactly the same question we grappled with uh, in 1988. How best to spend limited public dollars in a way that maximizes the health benefit across the population? Exact same question, 30 years later. And we're also facing another $1 billion shortfall in the Medicaid budget, just as we were uh, in 2011. Another opportunity, I say, to bet on the come. So let's recap what we've been doing over the last 30 years. With the development of the Oregon Health Plan, we, we changed the way we allocated money within the health care budget. The CCOs went a step further by capping the rate of growth of those resources and tying them to outcomes and quality. The next step is to address the relationship between community health and spending money outside the health care budget. And there's a lot of public money in the system right now, a lot of public money. Uh, last year, the CCOs had over $900 million in cash in investments. Last year, net income for hospitals increased $360 million, and uncompensated care went down about $340 million, largely because of the expansion of Medicaid under the ACA. Again, public money, money from the fiscal commons. So it seems to me the central question over the next five-year waiver period is to figure out how to start redeploying resources from the medical budget into social investments with that deployment gradually increasing over the next five years so that by 2022, by the end of the next waiver period, the expending money on the social determinants of health becomes an integral and intentional part of the business models of both CCOs and hospitals rather than an afterthought. That's the big idea. That's the opportunity I think we have. I'm not suggesting that CCOs or hospitals become social service agencies or housing authorities, you know, or school districts. What I am suggesting is that we have come to another pivotal point in how we choose to allocate our limited public dollars. Knowing as we do that most of what we end up seeing in our hospitals and in our clinics and in our medical practices is the aftermath, the symptoms of problems that occurred first in our homes in our families, in our neighborhoods, and in our communities. Knowing that and still perpetuating this stark imbalance between medical spending and social investment is difficult to defend and I think is increasingly immoral. These are public dollars that should be spent in a way that actually gets a population health benefit. So what do we have to do to change that balance? Well, let me leave you with three thoughts. The first one has to do with redefining hospital community benefit, which I know you've talked about today and we'll talk about some more. The second one is changing how CCOs are paid. And then the third one is how do we seek an additional five-year federal investment to create a, a glide path during which that transition can actually take place? How do we fund that hump over the next five years? So let's, can I get up the next slide? <clears throat> this is a slide I stole from Alan Yorty's presentation. But as you know, um, in exchange for the not-for-profit status, hospitals are required to provide a community benefit. Last year, they spent almost $1.9 billion on community benefit, but let's look how it was spent. 66% was spent making up for under reimbursement in Medicaid and Medicare. 13% for charity care, 12% for health professional education, some on research. The point is that 90, probably 95% of community benefit is spent inside the medical system and only 1% is spent actually on community health improvement. What is wrong with that picture? Now, we're gonna have a lively debate, I think, in the next session about hospital community benefit. It does not have to be a contentious debate. It doesn't have to be. It's being set up that way, but it doesn't have to be. If we could simply agree on the front end that the objective, the outcome of that debate should be a strategy to gradually begin to increasingly redeploy money from the medical budget actually into the community to, to directly address the things that have the biggest impact on improving the health of that community. There isn't a hospital in this state that doesn't somewhere in their mission statement talk about community health. So let's put our money behind that. I've heard someone say that if hospitals invest in affordable housing and God bless the Portland hospitals for doing it, that that's mission creep. I think it's creeping towards their mission. So this is the first thing we need to do. We need to look at this uh, objectively as collaborators and figure out a way to address that. 
The second has to do with how we pay CCOs. So even though coordinated care organizations and their budgets can only grow at 3.4% a year, the Oregon Health Authority goes through this rate setting process to determine how much they're going to pay the coordinated care organizations the next year. And that redundancy is due to a law passed, I think, in the 1990s to figure out how to pay the then fairly new Medicaid managed care plans. And the law says that capitation rates for Medi uh, Medicaid managed care plans have to be actuarial sound, actuarially sound. The problem with that is it creates disincentives for exactly the kind of investments that we want to make because determining actuarial soundness is based on an evaluation of claims. But a lot of the things that the CCOs do don't have a claim. There's no claim for the air conditioner. There's no claim for affordable housing. There's no claim for investing in early learning. So the dollars that the CCOs spend in those areas those flexible services we discussed are counted as part of their administrative budget rather than part of their medical budget, and as such aren't counted in determining the rate for the next year. Right? So if you're a CCO and you want to maximize what the state pays you, you're going to pull money out of the social investments, you're going to spend it all on your medical budget, which is exactly what we don't want to do. So the bottom line is that rate setting in a global budget doesn't make any sense. It shouldn't matter whether a CCO spends its money on its administrative budget, its uh, it's, it's medical budget or anything else, as long as they stay within the growth cap and produce the outcomes uh, and, the, uh, and, and the quality that we want, right? So th that's one of the things I think that we need to take on on the waiver. There's a couple of ways to do it, but I do think that issue ought to be front and center. It's just a disincentive for what we're trying to do, and it undermines the experiment we've been on for the last five years. So that's step two. So the, the final step is how do we use, how do we fill this Medicaid budget hole, this billion dollar hole, which is due primarily to the reduction of the match rate under the Affordable Care Act and also to a reduction in our overall uh, match rate because the economy is improving. So as I understand it, the Oregon Health Authority has, in their waiver request, asked for another $1.25 billion in exchange for maintaining the 3.4% growth cap. From my personal experience, I don't think CMS is going to give us that money just to maintain the status quo. I think the likelihood of success goes up dramatically, however, if we use that $1.25 billion to leverage a redeployment of resources out of the medical budget and into social investments with a, gradually, uh, with a gradual increasing in, in, in that investment um, over the course of the next five years. So as I said, by 2022, we fundamentally change the business models of both CCOs and hospitals so that investing in those things becomes a part of their business plan. You know, and I, this is betting on the come. I couldn't tell you exactly how to do it today, but no one could have told any of us, none of us could have told each other in 2011 how we were gonna be here today. It's time to take a risk, it's time to stand up, it's time to be creative, it's time to not ask for a handout, it's time to say we're Oregon, we've done this for 30 years, we're gonna do it again, and this is where we're gonna be at the end of 2022. 20, uh, you give us the money, we'll deliver the results. Now, there's a couple ways to accomplish this, but I'm gonna give you one. And so here's the, the deep dive into the weeds, into the policy weeds that I promised you. <clears throat> what if, as a part of the waiver, we ask to redefine, uh, there we go, we, we ask to redefine the medical loss ratio, the MLR. The medical loss ratio is defined as the percent of the premium dollars that's spent on healthcare or on medical claims, right? And because we want to spend more on healthcare and less on administration, we keep trying to drive the medical ratio up so that we reduce administrative overhead and spend more on medical claims. But the problem is that simply reinforces the current model of increasing spending inside the medical budget. Suppose, however, we were to replace the medical loss ratio with a health loss ratio, with the HLR, which count, just like the slide with the OECD nations, counts both medical spending uh, and social investment, right? So if the medical loss ratio is 85-15, 85 spent on medical care and 15% spent on administration, then the health loss ratio would be 85-0. 85 spent on, on medical care, but zero on social investment. And what if, as a part of that waiver, we were to basically gradually increase the health loss ratio? So this is where we are today. We spend 85% of the budget on medical care and none on social investments. 
2018, we spend 5% on social investments on a little less on medical care. And that gradually goes up, and you can play around with these numbers uh, any way you want. But at the, end of, at the end of 22, we are significantly reallocating resources from the medical budget into those investments in the community that have a, a significant impact on the health of the population. So my point is that as a part of the waiver, we should ask for 1.25 or 1.9, whatever we think it's going to take, but we deliver a glide path that actually gets at the core f uh, flaw in the U.S. healthcare system, the failure to invest in those things that actually produce health. Now, one more final thought <clears throat> or point I want to make. We need to make sure that these social investments, if we pull this off, whether they're from the hospital community benefit or whether they're from the health loss ratio, actually go into things that have a demonstrable, evidence-based uh, uh, underpinning for really moving the dial on community health. And there's good evidence, but we need, to, we, we need to make sure that we have some sideboards on those. And we need to make sure that those resources are coordinated and leveraged with investments that are already being made by NGOs and other community partners so that we develop a powerful, uh, a coordinated uh, collective social impact. So let me close here by asking you the same question I asked when we started. What's the next chapter in Oregon's 30-year story of healthcare transformation going to say? Because you're going to write that chapter. You're going to write that chapter through the actions you take, the attitudes you take, the partnerships you take, the collaborations you enter into over the next year. Are you going to write a story of greed or a story of inspiration? Are you going to write a story of individuals and organizations milking the fiscal commons for all they can get? Or are you going to write a story of courage and compassion and generosity? Well, I got to say, I believe it's going to be the latter. I think the next chapter in Oregon's story is going to be a story of a community, the Oregon community, coming together for the common good to fulfill our responsibility to the next generation by standing up for the hundreds of thousands of anonymous individual Oregonians who still don't have any health insurance coverage, who have deductibles so high that for all practical purposes they are still uninsured, and especially, especially for the tens of thousands of children who without our leadership and commitment to social investment are going to suffer experiences that will cripple their success and mar their lives forever. We're better than that, and we are not going to let that happen. William Jennings Bryan once wrote that destiny is not a matter of chance, it's a matter of choice. It's not a thing to be waited for, it's a thing to be achieved. Our destiny, my friends, is in your hands. Thank you very much. <laughs>
But, but the, real, the real leadership has to come from the community. You know, the Oregon Medical Association, I'll tell you a little story about the Oregon Medical Association. In my first race in 1978, they chose to endorse a uh, land developer from California over, the, uh, over a young doctor who thought he had their, uh, their endorsement wired. Uh, and um, after kind of a rough beginning, uh, the leadership of the OMA, guys like Roy Scoglin back in the day, uh, they're the ones that passed the Oregon Health Plan. They got the medical community directly engaged. Uh, we had leadership from Dick Woolworth, who used to run what was Blue Cross back in the day, right? We didn't have an association of hospitals. We had a, hospital, a, a, a association of hospitals and health systems. We had a hospital association. So admittedly, it was a little uh, simpler back then. But the leadership came from you. The coordinated care organizations, boy, that was a huge bet on the come. And I can look here, I can see Bob Dannenhofer, I can see people in this audience, Mitch Greenlick, people who basically took a risk, led their colleagues, took that risk. And that's what's got to happen again. So, yeah, it helps to have someone with that background in the executive branch. It's not, it's not uh, uh, crucial. Yeah. You mentioned that uh, the current financing model is, as I think you said, increasingly hard to defend and increasingly immoral. Um, we talked about this uh, previously as well, but is the healthcare system immoral? Well, I don't think the healthcare system is. I think that what, what to me borders on the immoral is that we know we're spending money in ways that doesn't produce the outcome we claim we want. And failure to act on that, that, that troubles me a lot. You know, the healthcare system reflects the incentives that are in it. I mean, you know, uh, by the way, this, I got that from Donald Trump. <laughs> uh, who also says, when they uh, charge him with his business, business, whatever he does with his business, I'm just playing by the rules, right? So the healthcare system, you know, we can't blame uh, the ind individuals in the healthcare system because they're actually, you know, responding to those incentives. But we don't have to accept those incentives. That, that's our today, it doesn't have to be our tomorrow. And so I think the, the, the issue of moral leadership is people who are willing to stand up and at least acknowledge that set of slides I showed you from the OECD uh, countries and say, does that make sense in the United States? Or do I want to change this system? And you know, we have this unique opportunity in Oregon where we could do something profoundly important over the next five years. I mean, what the CCOs have done, what the hospitals, all those players have done is really remarkable, truly remarkable. But we also have a history of innovation and we can be bold, we can go long, and we can take that next step and begin to address something that all of us know is a problem. So, you know, in your slide and in and, and repeated slides uh, uh, when you were promoting the CCO model and, and drawing down federal funds of $1.9 billion. You know, we saw that slide with the hump, right? This is the, this is the money, the upfront investment, and over time, the trend line will fall down by 2%, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, shouldn't, we, shouldn't CCOs be at a place now that are more sustainable based on that vision from you know, five, four or five years ago? <clears throat> Have, have CCOs gone, in, in spite of the fact that the work that they've done is truly remarkable, have they gone far enough to implement that vision? Well, um, I was talking to, actually, it was, it was Phil over here uh, yesterday on this. I think they're well on their way. I don't think the system is totally mature yet. And the revenue shortfall that they're facing right now isn't their fault. It's built into the ACA. Right? I mean, it's, we're going from a 100% match rate down to a 90% match rate, and your, the economy's a little bit better. so. That match rate's going down. Uh, and um, uh, so I think we need to address that, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's a different kind of a hump than we had in 2011. That was just a budget hole and we didn't have anything to show for it. So we took that and we made lemonade out of lemons, right? Um, and so what we need to do now is say, okay, we, 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 need, we need to fill that hole because we need to sustain the current model that we have until it matures. But at the same time, we're gonna take another step not a sudden precipitous step, because that's what creates the political resistance. We're gonna do something tomorrow when actually there's a glide path. There's a glide path involved with reallocating resources, whether that's from the hospital community benefit or the health loss ratio. You can't do that overnight, but if you can create a path so that people have time to prepare, they have time to innovate, they have time to collaborate and cooperate, then you can make it a reality, and that's the opportunity we have, I think, before us right now. Let me throw a couple of uh maybe stipulations at you, which you can, of course, disregard any of them, but the, the, the punchline question is, uh, do we need greater regulation 
of healthcare of the industry by government in order to get there to be more of a, not just collaboration but more real of a uh, more of a hammer approach and let me like i say throw a couple of stipulations out which is for instance one uh studies have shown that 75 percent of pricing is from market leverage and not cost two it's 2016 and even though the expansion happened of, of Medicaid happened in 2014, CCOs were implemented in 2012, and the ACA passed in 2010. We've had six years, if not longer, to think about this question of community benefit. Three, the, the model is supposed to work in that if hospitals and consolidated providers are doing well, then health plans should have greater leverage. You should see that transfer back to, the, to consumers and employers in the form of lower premiums. I don't know that there's any evidence that any of that is happening. We've had plenty of time to think about this, I think collectively. Do we need greater regulatory oversight and demands on the community benefit piece of this equation? Well, um, let's look at the problem. I think you know, your CCO model is capped, 3.4%. Uh, we don't have a similar cap on hospitals. We don't have a similar cap on prescription drugs, both the costs of both of which can blow up a system that's operating under a fixed budget. Uh, I do think hospitals have a responsibility not only to uh, figure out how to, or maybe we do this together, but figure out how to make the community benefit really a community benefit, right? Uh, and I think that they have to be much more transparent in their cost structure. I mean, the 66% is, is making up the difference between hospital costs and what Medicare and Medicaid pay, but hospital costs are determined by the hospital through a process that's extraordinarily opaque. And unless you begin to address the hospital cost structure itself in a serious and meaningful way, it's gonna be difficult to get there. There's no reason we need 60 urgent care clinics in the Portland metropolitan area. Someone tell me why that is, is necessary besides market share and getting people funneled into your institution. Tell me how that actually improves the health of the community. So that's a big issue, and we need to talk about it not as somebody's right or wrong or good or bad, but that's just, that, that, that's, that's gotta be addressed. The other thing that's gotta be addressed is prescription drug costs. Um, and I don't know how many of you followed this, but the new drug, uh, Hovarti, uh, that can cure hepatitis C, it's one of those, it's just a miracle. Uh, the Washington State Health Authority was providing that only to Medicaid people, clients, who had some liver damage, which was a, you know, a, it was a cost issue, just like back in 1988. The federal court, uh, in response to a class action suit, uh, ordered that the health authority provide uh, Hovarti to anyone uh, on the Medicaid population in Washington that uh, had hepatitis C. That tripled their drug budget from $1 billion to $3 billion a year, with no legislative conversation, with no oversight, the same year, the company that made that, I think it's Gilead, had something like $17 billion in net profit and invested like 40% buying back their own shares to increase shareholder value. We should really be outraged by that. And that $2 billion is gonna come out of housing, it's gonna come out of education, it's gonna come out of something. So we have to, I think, revisit the prioritization debate that we had back in the 1980s as it, as it, as it relates to those other costs, external, external costs that are gonna drive up the, the cost of the CCOs. Uh, and we have to get very, very serious about what we're gonna do about the cost of uh, medical devices and, uh, and, and uh, prescription drugs. So I wouldn't know that, I don't know, that, I, I don't know if regulation's involved, I think there's certainly some regulation around the, the at the federal level around the, the, the pharmaceutical issue. But let me just conclude by saying, when I've talked about uh, the hospitals and the CCOs beginning to reinvest resources on the front end, the insurance companies have got to have skin in the game. Uh, the medical device companies, the pharmaceutical companies, all have got to get skin in that game to the extent that they're funded with public dollars. And to me, that's the key. Public dollars have a different call, a different claim. We have a different responsibility in how we spend those uh, than we do with people's private after-tax dollars. Governor John Kitzhaber, let's give him a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you very much.